All right, last time we started talking about how following the, the collapse of the United Roman Empire, you know, with the Western Roman Empire fell in the day, this is late 476 AD. But you saw, what we see are that civilizations developed on the ruins of the former Roman Empire. And one of the civilizations we discussed on Monday was the Byzantine civilization that, that kind of grew directly out of what had formerly been the eastern part of the Roman Empire, the Greek-speaking eastern part of the empire. And uh, we started to look at Byzantine civilization. And we're going to finish that today. Another area was uh, the area uh, in uh, the, the Near East. And uh, this would be developed into Islamic civilization, uh, usually linked very inextricably with the Arabs. With Arabs and Islam go together very closely aligned to one another. You know, Islam is a, a universal religion like Christianity and Buddhism. Its uh, very its early days were very closely rooted to the Arab culture and Arabs. <coughs> and uh, and then another civilization developed in uh, the western part of the Roman Empire that was uh, at its root Germanic, uh, speaking, people speaking Germanic language. And uh, these uh, one of the more important Germanic tribes to emerge and to create an empire in the western part of what had been the Roman Empire would be the Franks. Uh, so we're going to be talking about these different successor states to Rome. And we're going to finish Byzantium today talk about Islam and its impact, and then focus on uh, Europe after that, Western Europe in particular, and the Franks. All right, so let's finish up Byzantine civilization. Now, one thing about Byzantine civilization was it was very closely aligned to the Orthodox Church. And uh, remember, the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church had their great schism. They, they broke, went their separate ways in 1054 AD. And that schism was was, it, was um, about technical issues. I mean, the, in, a, in a sense, it wasn't so much theological as it was about administrative. I mean, the, the Roman Pope declared himself to be the leader of all Christians, and the Eastern Orthodox Church, led by the Patriarch of Constantinople, said, no, you don't lead us, and believed that all the churches were uh, co-equal with one another, and as opposed to just saying that the Roman Church was the dominant and superior church. And but there are other issues, and we discussed that issues like uh, how the or churches were organized. Uh, you know, in, for example, in the Orthodox Church, um, you had uh, monasteries that were separate, independent from the local bishop. Whereas in the West, all all the monasteries were subject to the authority of the bishops, the authority of the church. Um, Differences um, my, uh, like uh, the, the emphasis on the emphasis on resurrection in the Orthodox Church, the emphasis on the crucifixion in the Roman Church. I mean, this these differences, but theologically they were identical. They were both Duophysite uh, Trinitarians. I mean, they both believed in the in the, uh, the the ecumenical councils, like the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Council on there. So, in terms of theology, there was very very little difference, if none at all. It was just a matter of governance and who had authority over who. Uh, and the biggest difference, of course, one of the biggest differences was the language. You know, in, in the Roman church, Latin was the language of the church, even when the lang local spoken languages were different. Now, that's, there was a big difference in the Orthodox church in the sense that they allowed local churches to use their local languages for church services. So in the Russian church, you spoke Russian. In the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox church, you spoke Greek. Uh, in the Armenian church, you spoke Armenian. And, and that was acceptable. But in the, in the Roman church, there developed a tradition that the language of the church, regardless of the language spoken by the people, had to be Latin. So these were some of the big differences between them. Now, um, these differences, like I said, became ex exacerbated because when different cultures adopted Christianity, they tended to follow the culture of the people that had converted them. And, and uh, these had long-term impacts on the history of Europe. I just want to give you a real close example. Um, the Serbs uh, were Slavic people, and about the, about the 7th century AD, 7th, 8th centuries AD, the Serbs converted to Christianity. And they were converted by the Greek Orthodox Church. 
So eventually the Serbs adopted much of the culture of ancient Byzantium. Um, they adopted the Cyrillic alphabet. Even to this day in Serbia, like as in the case in Russia, you use a Cyrillic alphabet rather than the Roman alphabet. And uh, the Serbs would go on, you know, by the 14th century, the, the ruler of the Serbs had adopted the title of Caesar, Tsar. Uh, so, so they were influenced and shaped by the Orthodox Church. Now, the Croats are another Slavic people. They were, uh, they were a Slavic pe people. They speak the exact same language as the Serbs. In fact, the language is called Serbo-Croatian. So they speak the exact same language. Now, the, Ser the Croats, on the other hand, they were converted. They were uh, actually uh, conquered by, uh, we'll talk about him later, Charlemagne, about the 8th century, and they adopted Roman Christianity the Western branch of Christianity. And when it came to, when they started writing, they used the, the Roman alphabet. Now, historically, the two people, even though they lived side by side with one, two, next to each other, Croats and Serbs, uh, they're right next to each other, the Croats always looked to the West. You know, they've always been influenced by other Western churches, uh, German and Italy, Italian and German and Hungary, they always looked to the West. Um, and, but the Serbs have always looked to the east, and they've always been toward Russia and, and the east. Uh, during, uh, and this, this, this differences, even though these guys were right next to each other, these differences continued well into the modern era. During, the, during World War II, the Croats sided with the Nazis. Not, with, not that they were Nazis, but because the Serbs were pro-Russian and pro-communist, pro-Russian. So during World War II, the Croats and Serbs were killing each other just as much as Nazis and, and Serbians were killing each other. I mean, it was a bloodbath. And, and, and this is a great quote. Uh, Himmler, you've, heard, you've, heard, you've all know how bad Nazis are. Himmler was the head of the secret police. He was shocked by the brutality of the Serbs and Croatians. I mean, Nazis were shocked by these guys. One of, my, one of the mo most horrific stories is the, the, when the Serbs and Croats would kill each other, they would... Um, they would uh, take babies and, and stab them and put a message on it and float it, throw it in the river. Like, hey, screw you, Serbs. It would be like a baby with a, you know, a, you know, lying a dead body with a message on it. I mean, that's how brutal these guys were. Well, then, you know, just not too, re not too long ago, in the 90s, a war broke out between Serbs and Croats, and about 200,000 people died. Now, fortunately, this is, I'm being ironic here, they hated the Muslims as much as they hated each other, so they killed a lot of Bosnian Muslims as well. You throw all the Muslims in as another mix, another culture, and you got that's why uh, Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, when it broke up, and all these different ethnic groups, Bosnian Muslims, Croats and Serbs, they all went against each other, and you had like 200,000 people killed in the 1990s, in the early 90s. <clears throat> so, uh, so these, these ancient uh, ethnic and cultural rivalries, uh, now you can't really blame Christianity for it, per se, but it's the fact that you had a culture that was adopted by different people, and these cultural differences led to rivalries and opposition to one another. So these cultural differences were deeply rooted and had long-term impact on the region. Some people even said that a lot of it has to do with the Balkans being a very mountainous area. You've got one people in one valley who ate the people in the next valley, like the uh, the McCoys and the, the uh, Hotfields Hot Fields and McCoys, you know, how they hated each other. And it's like some people said the Balkans is just like one big mountain where the people in one valley always hate the next people in the other valley, and they have these ancient feuds going back centuries. So, so you, that might have been a part of the mix in the ancient rivalry between the, uh, the Croats and Croats and the Serbs because the Balkans it is a very mountainous area. In fact, we even have a term when you talk about different ethnic groups and people not liking each other, it's called Balkanization. <laughs> Comes from the, the Balkans, uh, where the Croats and the Serbs live. So, so there were other factors, and it wasn't just the, the Byzantine civilization, the differences between the East and West, there were, there were some other factors that probably played a role as well. But anyway, so, um, so one aspect of Byzantine civilization is, is how deeply it influenced cultures that were converted to Christianity by Byzantine civilization and adopted Byzantine civilization and adapted it and made it their own. Um, now another big uh, legacy of the Byzantine Empire 
And from my perspective, one of the best, because I, I love ancient Greece and ancient Greek culture, <laughs> was that the Byzantines were Greek. And they, they're very proud of their Greek heritage. And um, the works of the ancient Greek writers, like Homer and, and, and Thucydides and the great tragedians like Euripides, these, these great works of, Greek, of literature were, were methodically copied down and studied by, the, by scholars within the Byzantine Empire. They, they, they wrote commentaries. We, we wouldn't be able to read ancient Greek if it weren't for these Byzantine scholars. Many of them are nameless, who over the centuries uh, kept, wrote commentaries and wrote, uh, and wrote explanations of the terms and uh, explanations of the grammar and studied these ancient works and uh, passed them down through the ages from one generation to the other. Um, the reason for this was in the Byzantine civilization, having a knowledge of the great classical works was considered to be a mark of distinction, to be a mark of an educated man. So, for example, government officials, if you wanted to, in the, in the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantine Empire uh, inherited the traditions of the dominate, you know, the old Roman Empire. And so you had a very large and, and complex bureaucracy. We even, when we talk about, when you talk about complex bureaucracies, you, sometimes people use the word Byzantine to describe it, like, like uh, healthfair.com is a very Byzantine uh, operation, you know, very complex, nobody really knows what's going on, nobody knows how it works, even the people who run it don't know how it works. Uh, uh, that's how bureaucracies, that's one of the common complaints about bureaucracies, government bureaucracies, is that they can often become so complex that nobody really knows what's going on. And the, your, the word Byzantine is used to describe that, uh, that kind of situation because of the huge bureaucracies that, that were in the Byzantine Empire. But in the Byzantine Empire, if you wanted to <coughs> have a position of bureaucracy, and, and usually they were filled by educated people who were well off, you know, large landowners, they, you had to be well schooled. And uh, just to give you a couple examples, some couple of names. Uh, Zetsi's, uh, Zetsi's, the Zetsi's brothers, I think it was Isaac and I forget the other ones, but these two Zetsi's, they, they were wealthy landowners in Asia Minor and they're very well educated, and they opened a school in Constantinople to train bureaucrats, to really give them an, an, an understanding of Greek civilization and culture. And uh, these, the, these Zetsi's brothers, um, I think it was jo John and Isaac were their first names, they basically were responsible for a great deal of, of work in producing commentaries and, and works explaining the classics. So a lot of what we know about ancient Greece was because these two brothers worked so tirelessly to produce these commentaries and, uh, and produce new editions of these ancient classical works. Um, now, it, uh, it was the same in the church, in the, in the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, people who rose to high positions in the church usually were very well-educated men. And I, I want to mention Eustachius. He, he, you, both these men lived about the same time, about the 12th century. Eustathius was a bishop in the city of Thessalonica in, in northern Greece, and uh, it was one of the larger cities in the empire. And he was a, a like Zetsi. He, he devoted, devoted much of his time to writing commentaries and uh, discussing and, and producing new editions of these ancient Greek works. And much of what we have today is due to the work of people like Eustathius and Zetsi in preserving these ancient traditions. Now, what would happen? Uh, down the road would be when, when, the Byzant when the Byzantine Empire fell in 1453, when the Ottoman Turks were uh, taking Constantinople in the 15th century, these Byzantine scholars, with their great knowledge of the ancient Greek and the scholarship of ancient Greece, they got out of there. They didn't want to be taken over by the Muslims. So they moved to Italy, and they brought their works with them. So, and many people would say that this 15th century arrival of these, all these scholars, bringing their books and their writings and all their literature with them, that that helped to uh, stimulate the Italians and was a factor in the rebirth of classical civilization in the Greek Renaissance of the, the 15th century was really the, the, the great age of the Italian Renaissance. The Quattrocento. And it has to do with the fact that these, a lot of it has to do with the fact that these Byzantine scholars were fleeing the Ottoman Turks and came and settled in Italy and brought these works with them. And, and, and uh, also corresponds with the invention of the printing press uh, by the middle of the 15th century. And so all these great works of literature were printed 
with the new technology of the printing press and all these new editions of Greek work were, were made more available to the public. So, so the, the rediscovery in Western Europe of ancient Greek due to these Byzantine scholars was a, played a major role in the, the, the great Italian Renaissance uh, that we're going to study later, in the, later in, uh, by the end of this course. All right, so that's the Byzantine civilization in a nutshell. All right. All right, now we're going to move on, and we're going to talk about Islam. Now, um, like I said earlier, when you think about Islam, very early on, the religion of Islam was, was very closely linked and identical with the Arabs, the Arab peoples. Now, the Arabs were a people that had, we know about the Arabs going back centuries. Uh, one of the earliest references to Arabs are by the ancient Assyrians going back to the 8th and 9th centuries um, AD. Uh, we know that uh, that uh, in the sixth century, the uh, the, the the king uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, when he destroyed the Philistines and destroyed the city of Gaza, he gave Gaza to the Arabs because the Arab tribes had been loyal and served the Babylonians. So Gaza has been Arab since well over 2,500 years. Uh, it still has Arabs living there. <laughs> And now, now the Arabs uh, were, were historically disunited, divided up into many different tribes, uh, and uh, they were never united. They were uh, divided into tribes, and most of them were, were nomadic. Most of them, most Arabs uh, lived in, in, uh, as nomadic peoples, uh, living in tents uh, with their camels and their, their uh, horses and their livestock, and uh, they, they moved from place to place and made use of the, way, the oases, you know, the places where they could, springs where they could find water for their livestock. So, you know, it was very hot and dry and desert land, but there, there were little pockets where you could find water, where you could uh, feed your, or provide water for your, for your, uh, your livestock. But that was the lifestyle of the vast mass of, of Arabs for, for centuries, going back thousands of years. And there are still Arab peoples, Bedouin they're called, who live like that to this day in parts of Saudi Arabia and, and those parts of the world. Now the, uh, but there were other parts of Arabs world that were, were that had adopted urban culture. Now uh, in, in the land of Arabia, you, you had two cities, Mecca and Medina, Medina in the north and Mecca in the south. These were two cities that were located near oases, so they had a source of water. And uh, they were caravan cities in the sense that uh, you had these caravans um, Southern Arabia uh, had like um, certain uh, myrrh and frankincense. It had these uh, these uh, what do you call them? Smells? What do you call them? Words? Aromas. Aromas. They had these things that were were highly prized. And uh, South Arabia also had uh, cinnamon. So you had cinnamon and frankincense and myrrh and, and, and myrrh. Excuse me. And these were highly prized uh, from South Arabia. And so you had these highly prized luxury goods being transported by caravans, you know, camels. Uh, and Car uh, Medina and Mecca were both caravan cities in the sense that people stopped there uh, on their way up to bring these goods to the great cities of the Roman Empire, then the Byzantine Empire. Um, now, now the, the Arabs, some Arabs had converted to uh, Christianity, especially on the borders of the Roman Empire by the time you get to the 6th century. Uh, some Arabs were, were Jews. There was a very large Jewish community in Mecca and Medina. Um, but the vast majority of Arabs, up until the time of the Prophet Muhammad in the 6th century AD, were pagan. They worshipped many different gods. And uh, the city of, of Mecca itself was a uh, holy city for pagan Arabs because of the Kaaba. The Kaaba was a meteorite. It was a, me a black stone. Nobody knows when it fell, but it was revered. Now, this is very common in this part of the world. Uh, there was a Roman emperor named uh, Elagabalus who uh, worshipped a meteorite, the black stone of, of, of Syria. So, and th that was an Arab people. So, so uh, from among the Arabs, there had been a tradition of worshiping stones, and especially meteorites, because they fell from heaven, so they're thought to be signs from the gods. So this black stone, this Kaaba, was honored and revered 
by all pagan Arabs. And they would come and make pilgrimages to, to Mecca to see, to see the Kaaba stone and to kiss it. I don't really know if they kissed it, but you know, to re revere it as a sent by the gods. Now, um, Muhammad himself was from Mecca, and he came from a very prominent family, a uh, clan within Mecca, and uh, he, uh, he, he, his clan had, had hit some hard times, though, so he didn't have a whole lot of money. But he married a wealthy widow, and this wealthy widow had a caravan business, and he was, a, he was basically a camel driver. He, he ran a, a business that, that, that transported goods throughout Arabia. And many people think that it was during his uh, time as a trader, as a merchant, that he became exposed to different ideas. You know, the, he was viewed and exposed to Christianity, exposed to Judaism. And now, when about 610 AD, when Muhammad was about 40 years old, he, uh, he, became, he became intensely religious. And he came to believe that, uh, very strongly, that the, the pagan god Allah, which was this, now Allah in the Arab pagan religion, was the god of the heavens. He was the sky god. And, and uh, Muhammad became convinced that Allah and Yahweh and the Christian God were all rolled into one. They all, he came to, they were all the same God. Now, uh, now, the month of Ramadan was a festival, a, a harvest festival, that was a sacred festival among the pagan Arabs. And now, during the month of Ramadan, he decided that this was a time that he should dedicate himself to prayer to the one God that he believed in, Allah. So he began to... Uh, go into the cave. He'd go into into the desert, and he'd spend days away from people, living in a cave, and worshiping God. Now, according to to traditions of the Arabs, traditions of the Islam, uh, the angel Gabriel appeared to him and said, "You will remember everything I say to you because I am saying you the word of God directly." And he had this vision of Gabriel, and uh, so he. The, the story is is that he. Uh, continued to have these visions where the angel Gabriel would appear to him and tell him what to say. Well, he, he began to preach. Uh, he was told by the angel Gabriel that he was the prophet of the God Allah, and it was his job to go preach to the people. So he went down to Mecca and began to preach, and this created a problem because he was saying that all the idols that were worshipped in Mecca were, were wrong and evil, and they needed to be destroyed. And that didn't sit too well with the authorities in Mecca, the leading clans, because they made all their money from people coming to Mecca, right, to see the idols. So he was, he was, his life was in danger. Well, his uncle was, was a very important person in the city, and his uncle warned him that, that these people were out to kill him. So he fled. It's called the Hijra. He fled Mecca, and he went up north to the, the rival city of Medina. And uh, the Hijra uh, is called the flight, and it's important <laughs> because it marks the beginning of his ministry, the, really the beginning of Islam. Um, and so in, in the Arab calendar, year one is 622 AD. So you know, if you want to figure out what year it is for a Muslim, you subtract whatever the year is, minus 622, and you get the Muslim year. You know, we, in the West, we go A.D., year of our Lord, means Anno Domini, year of our Lord, and it's the year of our Lord's incarnation, so it's a Christian focus, so it's 2,013 years from the birth of Christ. That's, you know, according to our traditions in the West. And in the, in the Islam, the year one is the flight, the Hijra, the flight of the Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. Now, why was that so important? Because when he went to Mecca, when he went to Medina, he... Uh, had great success there. And he was able to convert the entire city to his religion. And he was embraced there. Now the Jews wouldn't budge. The Jews of Mecca, Mecca Medina would have nothing to do with them. It really bothered him that the Jews, um, and, and some of the statements in the Quran that are very hostile to Jews, they think were a result of his frustration at the fact that the Jews wouldn't have anything to do with them. But anyway, but he did convert most of the people, minus the Jews, in, in Medina. Now, when he converted them, he became the leader of the city, not just the religious leader, but the political leader of the city, and decided it was time to, to, to take over Mecca. And eventually, by 6.30 or so, 
Mecca was taken by an army from Medina. Now, when he took over Mecca, he didn't destroy it or anything like that. He said, God, Allah, has said that this is the holy city. This is the holy city. And the Kaaba was sent to the patriarch Abraham. So he, he, came, you know, he, was, he borrowed a lot. Well, he, if, if you're a Muslim, you didn't borrow anything. It was directly from God. But he said that Abraham had set up the Kaaba. And when he was about to, after he had about to sacrifice Ishmael. Now, in the story, as told by the Old Testament, uh, he, he sacrificed, he was about to sacrifice Isaac. And then he stopped because God stopped him. And that's a very important story in Judaism. But according to Muhammad, it wasn't, Isaac was the second son. Isaac was the bastard. And the true son of Abraham was Ishmael. And Ishmael was the one who was about to be sacrificed, but, but Allah stopped him. And then Ishmael and Abraham together created the covenant. The stone was sent by God as a covenant between God and the Arab peoples. And that all the Arabs were all descended from Abraham through his son Ishmael. So he kind of took the, the old, old Testament story and changed it a bit to suit the new situation. Now, now, according to Islam, though, he wasn't changing anything. He had the right story. The Jews and the Christians had screwed God's story up. They messed it up. And as the prophet sent by God, he had come to correct the record, to get things right, to get them straight, because Jews and Christians had perverted God's word. So that's what he was trying to do. So when he told this story, he was saying, this is the real story. What you read in the Old Testament is a lie, a, Jew, a story twisted by the Jews. So that's what he did. And so he made Mecca, which had formerly been the holy city for pagan Arabs. Now Mecca was the holy city for the, uh, for the new religion of Islam. Now, uh, Muhammad, now the one thing about Islam is that um, the Quran which is the holy book, we'll get to that in a minute. But, but basically, the thing about Islam is it's simplicity. It's, it's one of its reasons it's been popular down through the ages is because it basically says, you do X, X, Y, and Z, and you get to heaven. People like formulas, don't they? You do this, you do this, you do this, heaven! So, and that's why you just gotta do these things. All right, so, so what are the, now these, these, these things you do to get to heaven? are called the five pillars of Islam. And, uh, and uh, these are, these are if you follow these five pillars, it's like the four noble truths of Buddhism. You get the four noble truths of Buddhism, you get the five pillars of Islam. Um, <clears throat> all right, so you know, what are these now? What, for, for number one, you have to have faith. You have to have faith that there is, there's only one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. So they believe that one God, and uh, you can't worship any other gods. You can't make, there's no idolatry. Now, it, uh, Bohemond was influenced by Judaism, so he, he, he was against idolatry of any form. Uh, uh, in fact, you could not even make an image of anything because it might be worshipped. That's why in Islamic art, a lot of the art is very abstract, you know, squares and triangles. You know, they don't make images of things. It's, it's not very, because they're afraid that if you make an image of a, of a living thing, it might be worshipped. So that's why uh, Islamic art has traditionally been very abstract because they're so, Muhammad, just no images can be made at all. Um, but uh, there was no God but Allah, and uh, Muhammad is his prophet. So like I said earlier, Muhammad was sent uh, as to correct the mistakes of the Jews and the Christians. Uh, for example, now, now, they adopted many aspects of Christianity. For example, in, in, in Islam, Jesus is a prophet. He's just one of its, you know, the prophets begin with Adam and they end with Muhammad. And Jesus was a prophet. And they believe in the virgin birth. They call, they refer to Jesus as the son of Mary. Okay, so they believe in the virgin birth. They also believe in the second coming of Christ, of, of Jesus. That Jesus, they believe that Jesus did not die on the cross. That Jesus was, when he's about to be executed by the Jews, the evil Jews, he was lifted up into heaven and somebody died in his place. The guy who died on the cross was was an imposter, was it just a, was this a fake image. But Jesus himself was taken into heaven, and he's up in heaven, and he's going to come back in bodily form at the end of time, and he's going to kill all the unbelievers. Jesus is badass Jesus in Islam. 
He's going to come in with a sword. He's going to be wiping people off. Everybody who's not a believer in, in Islam is going to be killed by Jesus, just wiped off the planet, because he is the God of judgment, not the God of judgment. He's not a God. He's just a man. He's just a prophet. Yeah, and he's just a man and a prophet, but he's going to be the one who wields God's sword and, and the last judgment at the end of time. All right. So you can see how Islam takes ideas of Christianity. Now, if, of course, if you're a Muslim, you'd say this is the way, the way it's supposed to be. The Jews and the Christians screwed things up. But, uh, but you could also take a different view and say that, that Muhammad took ideas from Judaism and Christianity and molded them into his own religion. Now, if I said that, I'd probably get killed if I was in Saudi Arabia or in, uh, in uh, fighting along the uh, jihadists in Syria for saying such a thing. But, <laughs> but anyway, now, um, now another thing is that... Uh, uh, another important thing you need to do, and the second pillar, you have to have faith in God and Muhammad is his prophet. You also have to fast during Ramadan. During the month of Ramadan, every year, you must not eat or drink anything during the day. You can eat or drink at night, but during the day, you're supposed to fast. fast. And it's a time of reflection and um, asking and repentance. So you're supposed to use Ramadan as a time to look at your life and see where you fall short and where your sins are, and ask God for forgiveness, and also fast as a sign of repentance. Um, the third uh, pillar of Islam is charity. Alms is charity. Uh, in Islam, you are, you're required to, if you, have the, if you have the resources, to give charity to the poor. And, and that's why in, in, uh, air, in, Muslim, in the Muslim world, there's a lot of hospitals and, uh, and places for travelers to visit, and, and all kinds of public facilities and uh, uh, orphanages because they believed uh, any, any, anybody who had any wealth believed it was his obligation to provide for the poor and to help the poor and to give them assistance because it was they were uh, everybody was equal in God's eyes and some people were rich and some people were poor that's just the way God had decreed it so it was important for the rich to help the poor and uh, give them a, a helping hand uh, the fourth pillar was uh, that you must, everybody who can afford it, must go to Mecca at least once in their life to visit the Kaaba stone, the covenant sent by, by God, by Allah. So you have to go, if you can afford to, every Muslim must go to Mecca at least one time in their lifetime. And uh, the fifth pillar is that you must pray to God five times a day. And you must face the direction of Mecca and you have to pray five times a day. So there's five pillars, you pray five times a day. And it doesn't matter what time. Uh, I, I spent, a, years and years ago, I, I, lived, I, I spent a, about three weeks in Turkey. And uh, now, uh, you know, the, you've heard of minarets, right? Minarets are tall towers. You, the function of minarets is for the, the caller to get up there and, and say the call to prayer. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know Turkish or whatever the language was in Turkey. But it, it, on a, it didn't care what time of the mor morning, and they, they made those calls of prayer, and it was, you know, you sleep and you're like, <laughs> what's going on, man? Now they have loudspeakers now. It used to be, I mean, about probably, you know, about three or years ago, they just would use their natural voice. But now they have loudspeakers, you know, and, and, and when, when you hear that call to prayer, everybody stops whatever they're doing. If they're good Muslims, they, they, they get oriented, okay, where's Mecca? And then they get down on all fours, and they put their head to the ground, and they and they say their prayers to God. So that's uh, those are the five pillars. You do those five things, you go to heaven. Yeah. Well, God will judge you. You, know, you don't know whether you're, you're going to get to heaven for sure. You have to wait till you get there. Now they do believe in the last judgment. They believe at the end of time, after you know, Jesus comes back and kills all the unbelievers, that God will stand up and judge the world and those who who are good will have eternal life, and those who are evil will go to Satan and the devil and spend eternity tormented in hell. Question. That was my next question. What did they believe if you don't go to heaven? Hell. hell. Yeah, yeah. Hell is not a good place to go. Um, but uh, but they have a very, in, in, uh, they have a ve uh, Islam has a very uh, uh, sensual -like concept of heaven. Heaven is a place where uh, men enjoy um, these these women who are virgins, perpetual virgins, they, they're not really, they're like angelic beings, but you can have sex with them as many times as you want, they're still virgins. And, uh, and so you, men get serviced by these beautiful women, and you, you get all the food and drink you want, 
And women, if they go to heaven, they don't have to do any domestic work. You know, what are the clothes? <laughs> <laughs> so women get to they get to enjoy the benefits of not having to serve men because they they've got these angelic women, these virgins who serve the men. So, so you can see why a lot of men were like, "Yeah, I like this Islam. Yeah, this is a religion for me." You know. Anyway, but there are women who are Islam Muslim too, so you can't really say. A lot of women are very. Some women are very in the Islamic world are very devout Muslims. So I don't know. It, that's just the way it is. All right. Now, um, now one thing that's important to mention is that uh, um, that you, the, the, what happened with uh, Islam was that uh, that the when after Muhammad died in 632 A.D. Um, his words, his teachings, they were, came directly from God, as they believe, from the angel Gabriel, that his teachings were put into writing. So, so the Quran, the holy book of Islam, was not written by a Muhammad. It wasn't physically written by a Muhammad, but it was his words that were put down in writing, probably in the decades following his death. So probably about the middle of the 7th century, the Quran was, was drafted, was written down. And the Quran is believed to be uh, the, the the direct word of God, so you, it's it's supposed to be interpreted literally, and also you can only read it in Arabic. Any any translation of the Quran is not really the Quran. So if you if, if you're a Muslim, the only way you can really read the Quran and fully understand it is to know Arabic and read it in Arabic. So so. Uh, any translation of the Quran, like in the English, is called an interpretation of the Quran rather than the Quran itself. Now, now in, in the Quran wasn't the only source of revelation. You also had the tradition, the Hadith. You can see it up there. The Hadith, these were the sayings and the deeds of the Prophet. Now, the Hadith uh, were like these stories told about the Prophet Muhammad, things that he did, words that he said. Now, the Hadith was probably put together over several centuries, probably in the 7th and 8th centuries A.D. So it's a, it's a little different than the Quran. And, and there are different traditions out there in the sense that the Hadith, uh, some Hadiths are considered to be more authentic than others, depending upon the school of law, of Sharia law that you follow. Now, the, the reason why the Sharia law and Hadith go so much together is because the law of Islam, Sharia, this is the law of God's law, is based on both the Quran and the traditions of the prophet, the Hadith. So if, if you're a, 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 Mu, a Muslim lawman, a Muslim lawyer, a, mon, a man who studies Muslim law, you, uh, you have to know the Hadith, the traditions. And some traditions are more authentic than others. And there are different schools of Islamic law based on which traditions are considered to be more authentic than the others. <clears throat> now, the reason why Sharia law is so important to Muslims is because it's believed that it's the duty of all Muslims to spread Sharia law everywhere around the world so that the whole world follows God's law. Now, this has to do with the belief in jihad. Now, jihad means struggle. That's the, that's the easiest translation of it. Um, and uh, it is believed by <coughs> Muslims that there are two types of jihad, two types of struggles, the, the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. Now, the greater jihad is the internal struggle that each Muslim has because the idea is that uh, within every person, there is a, an eternal battle between good and evil so that you are every human being Within their in, the, in their soul is fighting this war against Satan. He's a, it, there's an internal struggle. You know, Satan wants you to do bad things. God wants you to be, do do good things. But and and the jihad is that internal. The greater jihad is that struggle to, to obey God and to, to, to obey God's will and to follow God's law and not be uh, not be taken down by the evil one by Satan. Uh, it has a lot to do with Zoroastrianism. You can see the links there and the battle between the struggle, the war between good and evil. Now, that, so the greater jihad is the struggle from within. The, the lesser jihad is the idea that Muslim men 
need to, and, and Muslims in general, need to fight against non-Muslims to impose God's law on them so that the whole of the world should obey God's will. Now, the word Islam, now, when, 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 during, after 9-11, when we were all trying to be friends with Muslims, try to show that we were so caring and <laughs> compassionate, everybody said, oh, Islam means peace. But that's not a very good translation of it. Islam, the way I learned it, means submission. And you will have peace. If you submit to God's law, the war that's been going on in your soul ends. And you, when you fully submit to God and obey his will, then you will have full peace. Because the struggle against evil is over, and you've achieved internal peace and internal harmony. So, when, when they talk about Islam, when you wage a jihad, the idea is, if the whole world comes to obey God, won't the world be a better place? All evil will end. All struggle will end. All violence and, and degradation will end. And the whole world will know peace and harmony. Because God's law, Sharia law, will be everywhere. So, so the, the idea behind jihad is, is uh, the motives are good. The motives is we're going to create a better world. A world where everybody's at peace with one another. And we're going to wage war against those who oppose us. Because they are allied with Satan. That's why, guess who uh, the two big Satans are in, uh, for the many Muslims? The United States and Israel. The great Satan is the United States, and the lesser Satan is, is Israel. Uh, those are only for what they call fundamentalist Muslims, who uh, I guess are a, a, another name for a fundamentalist, fundamentalist Muslim would be a Muslim who actually reads the Koran. But uh, <laughs> I'm being a little ironic there. But, uh, but, uh, um, but, but that's, that's the thing uh, about it. They, 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 that's what Sharia law is all about. That's, now, this is in the news a lot because we're, there's a jihad being fought in Syria for as we speak. People are killing each other in the name of Sharia law. Now, it happens to be that the two groups of people killing each other are both Muslims. But both are fighting in the name of Sharia law, imposing God's will on, on the world. Now, sh jihad is not about conversion. It's not forcing people to convert to Islam. It's about forcing the world to embrace and, and obey God's law, Sharia law. And, uh, and in fact, uh, you can't, in Islam, you can't forcibly convert anybody. Uh, you, now, you, if you're non-Christians and Jews can be killed um, without a problem. But, but Jews and Christians, as people of the book, people who have got the right idea but got kind of screwed it up, they can only be converted to Islam by persuasion, by, by reason, not by force. <coughs> All right, now, now when, uh, when Muhammad passed on, about 632 AD, what happened is that the tribes who had converted to Islam, they had a meeting, and they elected a new leader. And the first five leaders of Islam were all elected by the elders of the tribes. And uh, these, these leaders were called caliph. A caliph means a successor, means successor. These are the successors of the prophet, the prophet Muhammad. Now every caliph, was, the idea would be that they were both the political and the religious leader of all Muslims. Now like I said, the first five caliphs were all elected, and uh, it was during this period of these early caliphs that Islam really expanded in one of the most uh, incredible stories in world history. Within, over the course of <clears throat> less than 100 years, Islam, Arab tribes, conquered an area stretching from the Atlantic to Central Asia. Pretty amazing. And uh, like, for example, they, and they were doing it in the name of Jihad. Now, it was, it, was, it was believed that, you see, one thing about Jihad was that one of the haters said that, that if you, uh, you know, Everybody sinned, right? And, and you know, most people sinned, and you know, you would have to sit and wait for God's judgment for whatever you did in your life. You know, ultimately, your fate, whether you enjoyed eternal life or damnation, depended on where you stood with God. God would judge you. <clears throat> but if you died in a jihad, automatic heaven, baby. You didn't have to worry about anything. It was automatic, baby. You just went right to heaven. You didn't have to worry about anything. So that's. You know, you go, hey, you know, if I die in the jihad, all my sins are forgiven. Anything I did wrong. That's why you hear about, you know, you know what those 9-11 guys are doing? The, the night before they 
were martyred. They were at a strip club. They figured, I'm going to sin tonight because oh, tomorrow all my sins are gone. I'm going to heaven with all my virgins. Oh, yeah, baby. And they're out partying. They're drinking. They're not supposed to drink in Islam. No alcohol whatsoever at all. So they're out there drinking, drinking whiskey, partying with the strippers, probably having some hookers. They figured, hey, tomorrow I die in the jihad. All this goes away. But, but that's what they believe. So you can see now the, the Arabs, what happened was that this, uh, this new religion really united them. And they, uh, and they all came together. And all these Arab tribes that had formerly been fighting with one another, all of a sudden they were united under the leadership of these caliphs. Now, <clears throat> one theory is, for their, their great success, is that, uh, well, first of all, they were pretty good warriors. Arabs had been, had been recruited as mercenaries for centuries, going back to the days of the Assyrians and, and, and the Romans. Arabs were good fighters. They were good bowmen. They were good horsemen. So they, 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 were, they had a tradition of being good warriors and good fighters. But they'd always been fighting with one another as much as they fought anybody else. So that was always a, like a roadblock to success. But now they found a way to unite. And now one of the theories is that Eric, back in the pagan days, Every Arab tribe worshipped its own god. And loyalty to the god it was equated with loyalty to the clan, loyalty to the tribe. And, and one theory is that but the one reason why Islam would united all the Arabs is they could say, okay, let's put aside our petty tribal gods and, and believe that we're all united by one powerful tribal god, the god of hosts, Allah, and he can unite us. And we, we will all be loyal to him. So our strength and our power comes from Allah and we are united by him, and we will go out and we will fight for him and win glory and spread, you know, fight the Sharia struggle and spread God's law to all the, all the world. And so they, they went into battle with a great deal of confidence. You know, when you think, hey, if I die in this battle, I'm going right to the, you know, the, the beautiful paradise, then that's going to get, you're, you're, not, you're going to be fearless warriors. And they were fearless. I mean, they, their cavalry was unstoppable. Their horsemen were just, could defeat anybody. And uh, very quickly, they overwhelmed the Byzantine Empire. They, they conquered Palestine and Syria by 635 AD. Uh, and then they marched east and against the, the Sassanid Persians. And they were able to uh, conquer the, the Persian Empire. Now, it so happened, for, fortunately for them, that the Persians and the Byzantine Empire had been fighting that war against each other, right? And so uh, that made it easier for them to conquer both states, or to defeat both empires, because both empires were weakened by, by decades of war against one another. Now when they went into Iran, they, they encountered Iranian tribes. Iranian tribes that in many parts of Central Asia, and uh, they were able to convert the leaders of these tribes through persuasion to become Muslims themselves. Now you gotta remember that most of Iran had been Zoroastrians, and, and worship one God anyway. So making the transition from being Zoroastrians to being Muslims was not a big step for many of these Iranian tribes. So the, the many of these Iranian tribes, after they were defeated by Muslim, by Arab tribes, by Arab peoples, embraced the new religion of Islam. So, so it wasn't just by conquest, it was also many Iranian tribes embracing the new religion as they spread into Central Asia. Uh, now, when they got to Egypt, they found that many of the Christian population of Egypt didn't like the Byzantine Empire anyway, and embraced them as liberators because they were they were monophysite, they were Coptic Christians, and they didn't like being uh, ruled by the Orthodox Christians. So, so when the Arabs came, many many ethnic Egyptians saw them as uh, liberators because the, the 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 Muslims would say, "Well, we don't care what Christianity you follow. All Christians are, you know, nuts anyway. So whatever you do, we don't care." And so they could practice their religion. Uh, remember, Islam does not force anybody to change their religion if you're a Christian. So, so uh, for many peoples in the former Byzantine Empire, when the Muslims came, and to, or Arabs came and took over their region, they, they saw it as an opportunity to now practice their religion without any fear. As long as you paid your taxes, you were safe and, and, rec and recognized your second-class citizenship. All right. Now, um, the thing about, the thing about uh, Islam is that as they expanded, you see, uh, you didn't have to convert to Christianity, convert to Islam. But if you remained 
non-Muslim, you had to pay a, a heavy toll tax. And also, you were of a second-class citizenship. Uh, many people have pointed out that, that in many ways, Islamic law and dealing with its subjects borrowed from Roman law. Remember in Roman law, if you were a citizen, you had certain rights. If you were a non-citizen, you were a nobody. I mean, you could be tortured, you could be whipped. If you were a non-citizen, if you were a citizen, you could not be whipped. You, had, you, were, you, were, you, were, you could get a fair trial. Some people have pointed out that uh, in Islam, you have the same distinction, but now it's between Muslims and non-Muslims. So Muslims uh, get, don't, can't be tortured. They, they have equality for the law. They have, they, have certain, they have certain liberties, certain privileges that are denied to non-Muslims. And non-Muslims, in addition to being, having second-class citizenship, um, they also um, um, have to pay this heavy, heavy tax to the government. Now, and, but this, the tax and this, and this inferior status serve as motivators to convert to Islam. Because once you convert, you get that equal status with other Muslims. You see what I'm saying? Very similar to Roman law, in the sense that once you became a Roman citizenship, you gain Roman citizenship, you, you achieve certain privileges and status that were denied to non-Roman citizens. And uh, some people think, is it just a coincidence that Islamic law uh, kind of mirrors Roman law? Now, if you're a Muslim, you'd say, no way. It all came directly from God. But as an historian, kind of looking at it kind of, you know, with that critically, you might think, well, maybe Islamic law was shaped and influenced by the Roman law, considering the fact that the, the Islam was spreading within areas that had been ruled by Roman law for so many centuries or for a, for a long period of time. All right. So, so by 641, the, uh, the Muslims took over Egypt. Now, there's a great story. The story is that uh, when, the, when, the, when the, uh, the Muslim army, the Arab army, captured Alexandria, um, they were all hot and sweaty, and they wanted to take a bath, but there was no wood. So the story is, and this is probably a, uh, a lie, the story is that they burned the library of Alexandria so they could burn the books to provide heat for the baths. And so the, story, the great library of Alexandria was uh, supposedly burned by the, by the Muslims. Now, that might just be a... Call it a Call it a, a smirching a propaganda, but but because as we'll see, the Arabs were, were great scholars. But anyway, all right. So um, well, we've got for quite a while here. So let's take a take a little break here for a couple minutes. And uh, and uh, what I want y'all to do, uh, we'll do it, fill out, finish filling out your your folders. But um, th this will help you with our our assignment to, to do tonight. What I want you to do is learn a little bit about Muslim Islam today, and I want you to like talk about. Uh, you have Islam. You said Buddhism. You said Christianity. And uh, what does each religion offer the believer? That's the first question. And how do you get there? How do you get to where you need to be? And how do you get to where you want to be? So, so look at each religion. What does it promise the, its followers? Number one. And how do you how do you get that achieve what is promised? All right, and I want you to think about that. All right, so we'll we'll take a little break for a while. Um, um, now, like I said, uh, Islam really expanded very rapidly when we talked about some of the reasons for it uh, over the course of the uh, early seventh century. Uh, but there was a break. There was, a, a, there was a little bit of a hiatus in their expansion uh, during the caliphate of the last of the five elected caliphs. His name was Ali. Now, Ali was uh, married to the only child of Muhammad. Her name was Fatima. And Ali and Fatima had a son named Hussein. I had to put him up there, but like, same as Hussein, so, you know, Saddam Hussein, very popular name in Iraq. But... Uh, now, Hussein was their son, and Ali said, from now on, only the descendants of Muhammad should be caliphs, no one else. And there should be a, like, a hereditary line of <coughs> the descendants of Muhammad. So that would mean that Ali wanted his son, Hussein, to be the founder of a dynasty of caliphs. Now, the, uh, there are other Muslims, led by the Umayyad 
clan. Now, the Umayyad was a powerful clan from Mecca. They had been powerful even before Islam. And the leader of the Umayyad clan was a man by the name of Muawiyah. Now, Muawiyah said, no, we're not going to have that. And so there was a dispute over who would be the next caliph. And what the result was a civil war between the Muslims, some following Ali and others following uh, Muawiyah and the Umayyad clan. And in 661, Ali was assassinated. Later on, uh, at the Battle of Karbala, the Hussein, the son, would die. Uh, and uh, many of his followers would be murdered. And, uh, and this established a split in Islam. Now, um, eventually what had happened would be that the Umayyad clan, beginning with Miawiyah, they would establish a dynasty. So uh, they would establish a line of caliphs that were all of the Umayyad family, beginning with Muawiyah. But there were still, even after the, the, the killing of so many followers of Ali and Hussein, there were still many people who came to believe that, who were still loyal to that cause. Now, one of these men was a man by the name of Ali Mukhtar. Ali Mukhtar lived about 687 AD. And he lived in what is today Iraq. And uh, he came to believe that even though all the descendants of Ali were dead, they weren't really dead. That, that God, they, were, they were in hiding. And God would send a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad who would become the ruler of all Muslims, the true ruler of all Muslims, and he would bring justice and peace to the world. And his name was the Mahdi. The Mahdi would be, at the end of time, a, a, someone, a descendant of Muhammad, uh, of the family of Ali, who would bring justice and peace to all the world. Now, Ali Mukhtar started a war against the Umayyad caliphs, and, but he was eventually murdered, and his followers were slaughtered by the Umayyads. But from this point onward, there was a, a big uh, uh, rift within Muslims. Now, a minority of Muslims became known as Shia Muslims. Shia means followers of Ali, and these were the people who believed that only the true caliph would be a descendant of, of uh, the prophet Muhammad, and that this prophet, uh, this, this, this descendant of, of Muhammad would be the Mahdi. Now, the vast majority of Muslims rejected this, and they were known as Sunni Muslims, which means, can be translated as Orthodox Muslims. Now, in today's world, the vast majority of Muslims are Sunni, but you do have especially in Iran and uh, Iraq and in Syria and in Lebanon and in parts of the Middle East, you do have Shia Muslims. Now, the Shia, are, in a lot of ways, are kind of like Protestants in the sense that they kind of broke up into a bunch of different, I guess you would call denominations or sects. Uh, and it, it's, it depends on uh, where they stand on the teachings of the so-called imams. You see, a, an imam... Uh, 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 generically just means the leader of a mosque, but in, in Shia Islam, it is believed that God sends these imams, these holy men, just like he said to Prophet Muhammad, and these imams come down and preach God's word, and what they say is a direct revelation of God, and therefore has the same stature as the Quran. So now, where, where Shia are divided into sects is based on which imams they think are holy, now, some Shiite sects um, only accept certain imams, while other Shiite sects accept others. Like, for example, today in Syria, the, ruling, the ruler of Syria, Bashir, I was think that's his name, uh, the ruler of Syria, the dictator of Syria, is an Alawite Shiite. And they only follow, I think, six imams as holy. Iran are called Twelvers, because they believe there were 12 holy imams sent by God. So there are different varieties of Shiites. But the Shiites and the, and the Sunni kill each other and fight wars against each other uh, as much as they fight against Muslims. And so, you know, in, in Pakistan, for example, Shiite mosques are destroyed by Al-Qaeda. 
And uh, right now, Al-Qaeda Sunni Muslims are waging war against the Alawites and the Shias in Syria right at this, as we speak. Just today, uh, there's a big battle going in on in Aleppo between the rival Shiite forces of the dictator of Syria versus the rebels who are Al-Qaeda-linked Sunni Muslims. So these, these uh, and, and you know, the homeland and the holy place of Shia is Iraq, actually, because many of the events that, that saw the death of Ali and the death of Hussein, these events occurred in Iraq, in southern Iraq. So the, the city of Karbala is considered to be a holy city, and, and Shiite Muslims from all over the world will go to southern Iraq to visit these uh, holy sites. Uh, and, uh, for example, uh, uh, Shiite Muslims, in honor of Ali, they, during, when they honor his festival, they, they beat themselves with chains till they're bloody, they, because they believe that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Hussein, the son of Ali, died for their sins. Kind of sounds like Christianity, doesn't it? That he was a, this great man who suffered for the people. And so in honor of Ali, they all beat themselves with chains so they're bleeding uh, during this holiday. It's really kind of, I don't know, you can see it on YouTube. It's pretty, just put it on YouTube. It's, it's, I mean, they're just covered in blood. They're just beating themselves. Oh, I'm saying we love you. No, I don't know what they're saying, but something to that effect. All right, so, uh, so these, uh, these differences, it was actually, it started out as a, a dynastic struggle between the Umayyad family and the, the house of Muhammad. And then eventually it would, it would evolve over time into this, this rift between Muslims, between the Sunni Orthodox Muslims and the minority Shiite Muslims. All right, now, um, now the Umayyad Caliphs, they, uh, they, they're, they're under their reign, the, the expansion, uh, they, they focused their efforts on conquering the Byzantine Empire, and they moved the capital um, they moved the capital of the empire from, from Mecca in the south to Damascus in Syria because Damascus was closer to their field of military operations. And they, it was at Damascus that they built the first mosque. Uh, the, the most, one of the ancient, most ancient mosques in the world was built uh, at Damascus. The other ancient, the other early mosque that was built was also built by the uh, Umayyad Caliphs, and that would be the Dome of the Rock Mosque built in Jerusalem, uh, because uh, it was came to believe that Jerusalem was the third holy city of Islam. You have Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. Now, why Jerusalem? Because according to the traditions of the Prophet, um, uh, the Prophet Muhammad had a vision in which he was taken to, to Jerusalem, and he was ascended into heaven and saw God himself. He was taken up into heaven on a mysterious creature that's half, half horse and half camel, hard to understand, it's a mythical creature, and, it, and it, I shouldn't say mythical, the Islams might get angry at me, but, but it was taken up into heaven and saw God. So that's why Jerusalem, and when the Umayyad Caliphs, they took over Jerusalem, they built right over what had been the Temple Mount in the days of the Kingdom of Israel, right on the Temple Mount they built a mosque, and it's one of the holiest, after Mecca and Medina, after the Dome, on the, after after the Kaaba in Mecca, the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem is one of the holiest places in Islam. It's the spot where Muhammad reportedly ascended directly to heaven and saw the face of God. All right, so, but the, the mosque, the good thing about the mosque was that they were built just like a church. It was built as a place for people to come. Uh, the holy day of Muslims is Friday. You know, uh, it's, it's funny. Friday is Muslims, Saturday is Jews, Sunday is Christians. But, uh, Friday is a holy day, and, you're, and that's the day you're supposed to go to a mosque. And usually at a mosque, you hear God's word. So at a mosque, you usually have some Islamic scholar, a cleric up there, uh, talking about the, the word from the pulpit, uh, talking about the word of God, talking about the Quran, and, and teaching the people. And uh, so mosques, they, they were built to hold huge amounts of people. So what they did is they took the basilica. Remember, the, the basilica was adopt, adapted by Christians from the old Roman law courts. Well, the basil a, a mosque is just a Byzantine basilica, but they got rid of the altar. You don't need an altar, and replaced it with the, the pulpit, uh, where the where the cleric comes and, and preaches the word. So every every that that's the purpose of a mosque is for people to gather and hear God's word and hear a scholar. Now, in, in Islam, you don't have uh, preachers, you don't have ordained clergy, but the closest thing to it are these Islamic scholars, clerics. 
These are men uh, who dedicate their entire life to studying the Quran, studying the Sharia law, They're, and they and they are the ones who are often asked to uh, to speak and to uh, and to go up, get up there, and, and preach the word on on Fridays. All right, now um, now this expansion in, in, in continued uh, under the Umayyad caliphs. Uh, North Africa was taken in 698 AD, uh, and, and a, a similar thing happened uh, in North Africa that had happened in Iran. There were these, there were these Moors and Berbers. These were these were uh, tribes that lived in North Africa. They had been uh, independent of the Roman Empire, but they lived in the deserts, and they had a very similar lifestyle to the Arab tribesmen. And in mass, the, the leaders of these clans, the leaders of these tribes, of the Moors and the Berbers, they embraced <coughs> Islam. And, and they became part of the armies. They became part of fighting the jihad. So, so just they had a similar success as they did in Iran. And the, the whole tribes embraced the new religion. So it was with Arabs and now their forces enlarged by Moors and by Berbers, mainly Moors, that this army advanced and they conquered Spain. Uh, Spain was ruled by the Visigoths, a Germanic tribe, and they conquered it. And for, for 700 years, most of Spain, or a lot of Spain, was actually part of the Muslim world. And, uh, and it became known as the land of Andalusia. Uh, even Muslims today will refer to Spain as Andalusia. Um, now, and, 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 and this expansion would continue. All right, well, I guess we ran out of time today. But we are going to finish up Islam and talk about the, the Western Europe and Franks and develop, developments in Western Europe. We're going to get to that on uh, Wednesday. We're going to get that on Monday.